So welcome everyone to today's webinar concerning the new work permit legislation in Sweden. Before I start, I'm just going to give a few more seconds or 30 seconds to allow everyone who's registered for today's webinar to attend and then I'll get started. OK, I'm going to start now. Um, I'm going to go through some basic housekeeping. So this webinar will be recorded. You, the audience, are muted. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to add these to the Q&A box and we will try to address these throughout the webinar where possible or at the end. If we don't get the time to address all the questions today, we will send out responses separately together with the slides and recording. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jose and I am a senior manager within the global migration team at EY in Sweden. With me today are my esteemed colleagues and fellow team members within the global migration team at EY. Allow me to introduce you to Ellen Harrison, a manager with over 10 years of experience with immigration having previously worked in the litigation department at the Swedish Migration Agency and the legal firm in the UK. We also have Sharwan Saeed, a senior consultant, also a lawyer. She has worked with immigration matters for global and local clients for over three years, having previously worked at another big four company. Finally, we have Dylan Tarhan, also a senior consultant in the team, but with a different background from the relocation industry and foreign embassies. Dylan has supported clients with immigration related matters for over four years, but with both inbound immigration to Sweden and outbound to other countries across the globe. Thank you team for joining me today on this crucial topic. Now I want to start by saying that this new legislation has been a long time coming in Sweden. In some ways long overdue and if everyone doesn't mind me saying to some extent not going far enough. We will of course elaborate on these points throughout the webinar. However the new legislation has been a topic of much discussion and debate ever since the original government inquiry in February 2020. You could almost say that it has been going on for as whole long as the whole Brexit debate just more behind the scenes and out of the spotlight. Would you agree, Ellen? Um, yes, definitely. And as you mentioned, Jose, somewhat kept away from the media and the whole public debate. And if we look at the roadmap in slide now, you'll see the development since the current legislation was introduced in 2008 and the important milestones to have come into place since then until now, when we are just two weeks away from the new legislation coming into effect. Uh, I won't go into the details here as we will share the slides with the audience later for their own reference, but this is just to give you an idea of how the legislation has developed throughout these past years. Shawan, what would you say are the key changes that the new legislation will bring in just two weeks time from now? The new legislation will bring both new opportunities and challenges, as you can see from the slide. These include opportunities such as unlimited extensions for temporary work permit holders and the reduction of deportations of highly skilled workers due to minor administrative errors. Whilst at the same time, it will lead to new challenges such as the need to include employment contracts report changes in the employment conditions and the introduction of a maintenance requirement for family dependents of work permit holders. These opportunities and challenges uh, you can say are the result of the Swedish government's attempt to make Sweden an attractive place for highly skilled labor whilst also preventing the exploitation of the same in the Swedish labor market. Thank you, Sean. Then let's start with the opportunities, of course, particularly those two key changes that you specifically called out just now. 
that's the unlimited extensions for temporary work permits and the reduction of deportations due to administrative errors or minor non-compliance, which in some ways will be a huge relief for our clients and Swedish employers in general. If I can start with you, Ellen, and the unlimited extensions, I have three questions. One, how does this differ from today? Two, what does that mean in practice? And probably more importantly, three, how will this benefit employers and ultimately permit holders? Um, yeah, thank you, Jose. Uh, well, with the current legislation as it stands now, the main rule is that you can now only receive an extension to your permit for a maximum period of 48 months. After 48 months, you have to qualify for permanent residence or leave Sweden. Now, to qualify for an extension and permanent residence, uh, the main rule is that you have to have stayed in Sweden at least 44 months out of those 48 months. And you also need to meet a maintenance requirement as of last year. There are exemptions to this, and the Migration Agency can make a discretionary assessment and grant a residence permit valid for a further year or two to allow an individual um, to qualify for permanent residence uh, later on, or for example, finish a project for their employer. Although even the discretionary extensions come with the requirement of having stayed in Sweden for at least 36 months out of those 48 months. Uh, this is the main rule. However, the main requirement an individual needs to meet is to show that they have a strong connection to the Swedish labor market. If the individual has been in Sweden for 44 out of 48 months, the Migration Agency considers this requirement to be met. Um, this would mean that you can spend four months outside of Sweden during this four year period. Uh, and this might sound like a lot to a lot of people, uh, but during four years, you can quickly reach this four month limit as you, for example, may travel frequently for work. Um, the consequence in turn of this is that if you have not spent at least 44 months, uh, you will have to, you will not qualify and you will have to go home to apply. Um, and to counteract the deportation of highly skilled migrants, the government is now removing this 48 month limit and those individuals that do not meet the 44 month threshold or maintenance requirement can now apply for further extension. And the number of extensions an individual can receive from 1st of June are unlimited. So these changes are very welcomed as many employees and employers were hit very hard by this uh, part of the current legislation during COVID. Many individuals needed to travel home to family members or were stuck in their home countries due to restrictions. In this way, they quickly reached this four month limit and they risked being deported after four years. So this change is very much welcomed by all parties. This is definitely great news for employers and employees, particularly those who tend to work rotationally in Sweden, who in the past may have been forced, uh, faced with the consequences of deportation due to not meeting the minimum 44 month requirements that you just outlined now. However, these 48 months to qualify for permanent residence that you've mentioned, is that over a lifetime or a specific period? No, it is 48 months during a seven year period. This part of the legislation remains the same. The part that you need to have been in Sweden for 44 months also remains the same. However, you can, for example, should you not qualify for permanent residency after the initial 48 months, you can then apply for further extension and qualify for permanent residence after six years if you wish or later on. So this is great with the new legislation that allows this. Definitely, but I understand that employees will need to specifically request for their case to be considered for permanent residence. Otherwise, when they file the application, they will just be pre-treated as extension applications to the temporary residence permits. Is that correct? Yes, this is correct. Uh, the proposal for the new legislation emphasised that an individual should be able to choose whether they want to settle permanently in Sweden or not. When you submit an application, you will therefore need to state whether or not you apply for permanent residence. Okay, so that's very important in this case. Yeah. So will this new unlimited extensions and ultimately the new legislation apply only to new applications from the 1st of June or Will the, every application be impacted? Well, 
it is applicable to all applications where a decision has not been made before 1st of June, June. So there is no transition period of this legislation. This means that even if you submitted your applications, for example, four months ago, the new legislation will apply to you if you have not received a decision before 1st of June. However, in most cases and for most individuals, this is positive uh, as these changes are very welcomed, as I said, by employers and employees. With the new legislation, you remove the uncertainty of an individual, individual being deported after four years if they do not meet the requirements for permanent residence. Great, thanks Alan. It's a very important point that I cannot emphasize enough that you just called out is that the new legislation will indeed impact all applications where a decision has not been made by the 1st of June. And it's important to make it clear that this is for all cases um, as part of the new legislation and not just these uh, unlimited extensions uh, that you've just discussed. So Shawan, uh, to you now, when it comes to reducing the deportation of highly skilled workers due to administrative errors or minor non-compliance, the so-called skills deportation that has been a topic of contention in the past. This is not something new due to this legislation specifically. In fact, it's already a practice that has been followed by the Swedish Migration Agency since the Migration Court case in 2017. Can you elaborate further here? Precisely, Jose. That is correct. So before the 2017 court cases, we did see two rulings from the Migration Court of Appeal, which emphasized that people who cannot financially support themselves in their employment cannot obtain a new work permit in Sweden. These rulings pretty much interpreted the regulations literally, meaning that all conditions must always be met. So based on these two rulings, the Swedish Migration Agency then claimed that all previous shortcomings in the terms of employment, regardless of the correct scope and reason, would automatically lead to deportation. Based on these rulings, the Swedish Migration Agency then began in the spring of 2015 to deport highly skilled workers due to administrative errors. This was the so-called skills deportation period. This could be the result of an employee having received a few kroners less in salary or an insurance that was taken out too late. And then we had a breakthrough. On Lucia Day in 2017, uh, the Migration Court of Appeal came with the guiding ruling where they rejected the Swedish Migration Agency's deportation practice. The Migration Court of Appeal ruled that minor errors or mistakes must not automatically lead to deportation, but the Swedish Migration Agency must make an overall assessment of the terms of employment. The Swedish Migration Agency was therefore forced to make a complete U-turn in their assessments, which led to a reduction in the de deportations. But even if the problem became smaller, it wasn't completely solved. Great, so how does this ruling from 2017 that you just explained, now becoming part of the legislation from two weeks from now, differ from the improved practices that we've seen the Migration Agency take because of that ruling? So what will now evolve with the new legislation is that we will have the 2017 rulings reinforced in the actual legislation. So the legislation as it is today states that a time limited work permit shall be revoked if one, the conditions for the work permit for any reason other than the employment has ended is no longer fulfilled, or two, the foreigner has not started their employment within four months from the date the permit was issued. However, the permit does not need to be revoked if the employer has corrected the error without the Swedish Migration Agency having taken any action. Okay, great. So just, just to clarify on that point right there, you mean the employer must have corrected the minor error before an extension application is filed? Precisely. So the new legislation provides more clarity as to whether a permit should be revoked or not. However, it adds that a permit does not need to be revoked 
in minor cases or otherwise if a withdrawal of a permit in view of the circumstances does not appear as reasonable. So this means that an assessment should always be made, taking into consideration all the circumstances of the individual um, case to determine whether an error can be considered minor. However, if an error cannot be considered as minor, then we proceed to a so-called reasonable assessment. And in assessing whether an error is minor or not, the proposal states that one should assess the nature of the error. And when it comes to the reasonable assessment, the proposal states that an assessment should be made of the circumstances of the individual case where factors other than just the error itself can be considered. So for example, it may be that an excusable or reasonable explanation is given to why the error occurred, while at the same time it is clear that the employer will in the future meet the conditions. So the purpose of the new legislation is to ensure that labor migrants are not deported because the employer unintentionally committed minor errors in the employment conditions. The aim here is to end further deportations that occur due to insignificant uh, and excusable shortcomings. Uh, and there are many examples of minor errors that are brought up in the actual proposal. However, there are also some cases where an er when an error can never be considered minor. For example, mistakes committed for the purpose of abusing the rules on labor immigration or when an employer employer repeatedly or for a longer period applies um, conditions that deviate from the current requirements. Uh, other errors that are considered significant and not minor include, for example, not signing a occupational injury insurance. When it comes to the occupational injury, even if it has only been missing for a short period, it can have major consequences for the employee if an accident occurs and therefore, as a rule, it's not considered a minor error. Okay. So what does this all mean for employers as well as employees? Well, the new regulation intends to clarify what can be considered minor errors and therefore it allows for employers and employees to argue on this basis as well as what is reasonable when it comes to revoking permits. Great, thanks Sean and I can guess there's much needed clarifications here concerning minor non-compliance non or errors, uh, as you said, for sure. And great examples there that you've provided. OK, if we move on, uh, there are other opportunities from the new legislation, including the ability to apply for a re-entry visa to return to Sweden, whilst there is an ongoing application and the introduction of a whole new permit category for highly skilled individuals. Dylan, I'm going to turn to you now. And as you and I know, one of the most common questions and frustrations that we receive from applicants always concerns any upcoming travel whilst they have a pending application whilst after their basic per, per current permit has expired. So how does the re the reentry visas you know, facilitate this somehow? Thank you, Jose. I would say that this is definitely a topic of conversation. A concern that many individuals have had to face is precisely their restriction on traveling. The issue has not been whether an individual can leave Sweden or not. Instead, it's about re-entering the country. Certain third country nationals are visa required nationals, meaning that they must be in possession of a valid work and residence permit or a Schengen or National D visa to enter Sweden. A D visa is specifically issued by the Swedish embassy abroad only in special circumstances though. Such issuances vary from embassy to embassy worldwide, and therefore there are no guarantees that a visa can be issued to be able to return to Sweden. The purpose for this new legislation is that a re-entry visa, the D visa, should be granted to individuals who have an ongoing extension application and need to travel abroad for business purposes. The proposal states that the visa should be applied for from within Sweden. 
this all sounds great, but how do we apply for such a D visa? Well, there's already an established guideline on how D visas are issued in general, but the exact approach to this new proposal still remains unclear. We should expect to receive more information on this, though, once the legislation has entered into force on 1st of June. What we do know now, though, so far is that the same application form used today will still be needed, although these applications should be handled from within Sweden according to the proposal. Whether an individual can apply for this online or they need to physically visit the Swedish Migration Agency office is still unclear. And also the standard fee of 60 euros will remain as it is today. OK, so you mentioned in the proposals the re-entry visa will be issued for business purposes only. But what does this mean for those who wish to travel for other reasons, such as holidays, especially as we're coming up to the summer period, or even family emergencies? That's a very good question, Jose, and actually a hot topic right now, because this visa will in fact only be issued to work permit holders and not their family members who are in the same process of renewing their permits as dependents. So for instance, if a dependent who holds a resident permit is also employed in Sweden and must travel for work, this individual will not be eligible to apply for the D visa since they possess a dependent permit and not a work permit. So to answer your question, those who wish to travel for holiday, family emergencies or other reasons will not be able to apply for the D visa under the new legislation. Instead, they will need to continue to apply for a D visa from the embassy abroad before returning to Sweden, which as we know is not guaranteed and typically only issued in limited circumstances. Well, that's unfortunate <laughs> because it doesn't go far enough into resolving the frustrations we've seen today and what looks like will continue in the immediate future. So Dylan, continuing with you and moving on to the permit for highly skilled individuals, or as I like to call it, the job seeking permit for highly skilled workers. Can you explain to us what this is exactly? Yes, Jose, I agree that this is a better name for the permit. The Swedish government is introducing a new permit for highly skilled individuals. The reason behind this is to attract highly skilled foreign workers, especially in industries lacking competition here in Sweden. The purpose of this new permit is to provide an opportunity for these individuals to travel to Sweden without having an employment in place first. So this gives them the chance to look for work or set up a business whilst they are in Sweden. It is important to note though that the permit will only be granted for a maximum period of nine months. So Dylan, who qualifies for the new highly skilled permit? To qualify for this permit, uh, the applicant must have completed postgraduate studies, for example, a master's or postgraduate degree or diploma. They must have sufficient funds during the full per, uh, permit period and enough to cover a return flight. Uh, they must also take out comprehensive health insurance that covers their entire duration of stay in Sweden. Thanks. I mean, this sounds great from an individual perspective who's looking to come to, you know, try a little bit of Sweden and see if they want to, you know, settle. But what is there something employers need to be aware of because of this new permit category? Yes, employers who wish to employ a third country national is uh, in possession of this permit category will need to apply for a work permit before the employee can start working. So the good news is that this this can be done from within Sweden and they won't need to leave the country, which is the usual requirement when applying for a work permit. The individual will be able to start working before a decision is made, which means that as soon as the application has been submitted to the Swedish Migration Agency. Um, it is important to note that due to the limited permit period of nine months, permit holders will not be able to obtain a personal number, which we understand can be a requirement from some employers before deciding to employ a third country national. As it is now, the Swedish tax agency only issues personal numbers to those who intend to reside in Sweden for more than 12 months. 
Great. Thank you, Dylan. I mean, this certainly opens, you know, it certainly opens employers and the Swedish labour market to a potential bigger talent pool, giving highly skilled individuals the opportunity to come to Sweden to look for work and set up a business. Whether it be a success or not, it will depend later on once we know the exact number of permits that have been granted by the Migration Agency. Now, we've covered opportunities to date. Now let's move on to the challenges. As we have already pointed out at the beginning, one of the original intentions of the government's proposal for this legislation was to prevent the exploitation of foreign labour in Sweden. So, Shawan, we have the requirement for employment contracts to be included in the work permit applications, something that's not been previously needed, and the need to report changes in employment conditions. But how does providing employment contracts aim to prevent the exploitation of foreign labour in Sweden? Yes, so like you mentioned, Jose, with the new legislation, there will be a requirement for employment contracts to be included with the work permit applications. And when it comes to the employment contract, they can be oral or written. However, the burden of proof will be on the applicant. Either way, this means that it will be especially important that the terms and conditions in the offer of employment, which is submitted to the migration agency, is reflected in the actual employment contract. That means that, for example, the salary and the insurances set out in the offer of employment must match what is stipulated in the employment contract. For employers who typically assign their employees to various countries globally, they might already have an assignment letter template in place. For those cases, the templates might need to be modified um, or tailored specifically for Sweden to ensure that they meet the new requirements. Um, it may also result in local trade unions uh, requesting copies of the employment contracts when they review the offer of employment to provide a statement um, necessary to proceed with the work permit application. Overall, this will indeed be a very good aim to prevent the exploitation of foreign labor as the offer of employment is not legally binding for the employee, however the employment contract is. A foreigner can have invested both time and money to be able to move to and work in Sweden, so an employer cannot lure labor migrants with attractive employment conditions and then turn around and make non-beneficial changes to the employment contract. And in addition, for Sweden to attract foreign talent, good employment conditions are required. An employer who does not fulfill their commitments can not only cause difficulties for the individual labor migrant, but also damage Sweden's reputation and business opportunities to recruit from abroad. So it is very important that one, labor migrants receive the salary and the other conditions set out in the offer of employment and two there will be an obligation for the employer to report changes in the employment conditions okay so we have the need for the employment contracts with work permit applications going forward but if there are changes in conditions how should employers report these well, new conditions should be reported no later than one month after they come into effect. And if the employer fails to report these changes, there is a risk of penalties. The Swedish Migration Agency has not yet communicated the level of possible penalties, nor have they communicated how employers are supposed to fulfill their reporting obligations. So our advice is therefore to proactively track changes which worsen the employment conditions and report these as soon as it is known how this will be done. Examples of these change, changes or worsened conditions are yet to be clarified by the migration agency. Uh, overall, this will strengthen the labor migrant stance 
uh, it will provide protection and reduce the risk uh, for the safety in the employment contract to be undermined. So in conclusion, I would say that this means that there is a greater responsibility um, and an administration for employers than what we have seen to date. Great. Thanks, Sean. And much that still needs to be clarified by the migration agency until we know more. But key, as you said, to ensure the employees have their records in order to be able to report these changes as soon as possible. Now, on the introduction of the maintenance requirement for accompanying family members of first time resident permit holders, which will lead to a harmonization of this same agreement across all major permit times. Ellen, Exactly what does this mean for main work permit holders and how does this change from the requirement today? Well, today, Jose, an individual only needs to show they meet the maintenance requirements for themselves, no matter how many dependents they actually bring with them to Sweden. And as a way of decreasing the burden on the Swedish social security system, the government are now introducing a maintenance requirement applicable for all employees and their dependents. So now the employee needs to show that they can not only support themselves, but also all the family members that they bring with them to Sweden. The amount of income necessary in order for you to fulfill the requirement depends on how large your family is and how high your housing costs are. You meet the maintenance requirement if your income per month from your employment or company co covers your housing costs and the so-called normal amount. Now, the normal amount is calculated by the Swedish Enforcement Agency each year and it varies, but for 2022, it's around 5,000 sec for single adults, uh, around 8,500 for spouses or partners living together, and between 2,700 and 3,000 sec um, for children, depending on the age of the child or children that you bring with you to Sweden. Now, the actual housing cost will probably be unknown for most individuals, as most people have not arranged a permanent accommodation prior to moving to Sweden. The migration agency will then use the standard rate rent for the area the individual will live in when calculating the maintenance requirement. Now, the Swedish Enforcement Agency and the Swedish Social Insurance Agency have regulations regarding this and you will be able to find that information on their website or of course ask us. Um, and just to clarify, this does not remove the requirement for a salary to be in line with what is customary in the same occupation and industry in Sweden. So you will still have to meet that requirement as well as the maintenance requirement as I just described. Something to also remember is that this requirement is only applicable to first time applications and do not apply to extensions, except for when you apply to extend your permit and you apply for permanent residency at the same time, then you will have to meet another maintenance requirement. OK, just to confuse us more with more maintenance requirements. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, are there any circumstances where an individual could be exempted from this maintenance requirement? Uh, yes, according to the proposal for the legislation, an individual could be exempted from the requirement. However, it remains to be seen how the immigration agency will interpret these exemptions. In the proposal, they mention some examples, such as if the employee cannot fulfill the maintenance requirement by themselves, then maybe you can fulfill it together with your spouse or your partner. Another example is if an individual has been working in Sweden for some time and is injured due to an accident and therefore do not fulfill the maintenance requirement. But as I said, we need to be a bit careful and wait for the migration agency to communicate how they will actually assess these exemptions, as the proposal only provides some limited examples on what would qualify as exemptions. The migration agency has not yet communicated anything regarding this, and unfortunately, this is their standard way of working. They usually do not communicate anything until the new legislation is actually in effect or sometime afterwards. But this regulation, as you mentioned, Jose, has been in place for other permit types, and it is a qualified guess that the migration agency would assess this equally across all permit types. Great, thanks, Ellen. So a lot of requirements, and yet still clarifications needed from the migration agency. Yes. 
Dylan, uh, moving away a little bit from what we've discussed so far, so besides the opportunities and challenges we've said, based on your experience with other countries and their work permit legislations, do you think this new legislation goes far enough to attract foreign labour in Sweden? Well, yes, Jose, I would say that this is definitely a good start uh, for the Swedish labour market, especially with a new permit for highly skilled workers. This presents new opportunities for highly qualified individuals to come to Sweden before actually deciding to settle here. Um, there are actually similar visas and permit categories for highly skilled migrants in other countries. So it's exciting to see that Sweden is following this trend, I would say. However, I would also say that by comparison to other countries who already have an established labor market for highly skilled workers, those countries allow this type of permit to act as a work permit too. In Sweden, though, this will not be the case, which is why, as you, Jose, earlier mentioned, this permit category is more of a job seeking permit. And if we look at some of the developments over the last few years, especially as a result of the pandemic, we have seen countries such as Croatia, the Czech Republic, Estonia, and Malta, to name a few European countries, introducing nomad visas for remote workers. Also, in March this year, Italy actually approved a new legislation effectively permit, uh, permitting third country nationals to work remotely. So by comparison to these developments, Sweden is still lagging behind and may well find it difficult to attract highly skilled workers in the future if it does not keep up with the rest of the world. Great, thanks Dylan for this insight and perspective. Ellen, when the new regulation for permanent residents came into effect in July last year, we experienced huge delays in processing times to which the effects are still felt today. Can we expect these same delays or worse to happen again from the 1st of June because of this new legislation? Um, yes, Jose, unfortunately. And as you mentioned, we are still experiencing the delays of the new legislation for permanent residency almost a year later. So as we have mentioned throughout this session, the migration agency are not very proactive when it comes to new legislation and often do not analyze the changes or communicate any guidelines until after the legislation has come into force. In the case with the legislation for permanent residence that came last year, it took several months for the migration agency to communicate how certain assessments should be made, and they requested a lot of additional information and requests from applicants. So based on previous experience, this is likely to happen again. So yes, unfortunately, people would need to expect delays, but we will of course work together with our clients to be proactive and submit documents we know will be requested and so on to try to minimize these delays. Yeah, that's the keyness. Despite the legislation, as we've all spoke about today, being quite reactive and government authorities still taking time to clarify that, we need to try to really be proactive with our clients and help them navigate these uncertain times that lie ahead. Yes. Great, thank you. If we go back then to the question, just to kind of wrap up what we've discussed today um, as part of the you know, webinar, how will the new legislation reshape labour migration in Sweden? So what key takeaways would each of you and advice would you give to the audience today? Yeah. If I can start with you, Ellen. Yeah, uh, Jose, I think it is what I just mentioned, to be proactive, to submit documents that we know will be requested, Employers should be prepared for delays in processing time, so you may want to initiate you know, your cases earlier than you've done previously. You should be prepared for additional information requests from the migration agency as they are working their way through the new legislation and until they also have put their new processes in place. Employers should also already now be doing the calculations for the maintenance requirements. And we are, of course, happy to help with this. And we are already doing this for applications being submitted now for our current clients. It is also important to remember uh, that the new legislation will impact both new and existing applications after the 1st of June. Um, now, Sharon, would you like to add anything to that? Yes, thank you, Elin. Well, I would say as an employer, 
keep in mind that what is stipulated in the employment contract must be reflected in the offer of employment and vice versa. This, of course, will require a more detailed review of the conditions set out in the agreement for uh, for the employee. And as employers, we now have more capacity to argue when it comes to errors, shortcomings or mistakes that have been made during the employment period. So that is a positive note. So with that said, I'll leave the word over to you, Dila. Thank you, Chawa. In addition to what you and Elin have said, we expect to see more responsibility from the employer. I can also add that uh, the new opportunity to apply for a D visa within Sweden to travel for work purposes is something work permit holders have been waiting for. And we've seen this with our clients as well and their employer, employees, especially with the current delays in processing times. We see this as very beneficial to employers as noticeably this limitation has affected businesses when employees have been restricted from traveling. However, it does not go far enough to include dependent family members whose applications are pending at the same time, nor does it allow for other travel purposes, for example, family emergencies. So to summarize, we welcome this new legislation and see this as an opportunity to reshape and develop the current labor market here in Sweden. But does it go far enough? Well, I would say that only time will tell. Right. Well, thank you, Dylan, and thank you everyone for your input today. Now, I want to move on to any questions we might have received. I don't see that we have, but I, we are going to stay on. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put these in the question and answer box. It should be on the top right hand corner of the Teams uh, webinar. Uh, we'll stay on for any questions. So please do ask. I know Swedes tend to be shy, but please, please ask questions. Uh, that's what we're here for. So I will stay on awkwardly for a minute, um, but please do uh, ask any questions. Eva, we've done such a great webinar that no one has any questions and we've really addressed everyone's doubts, then that's fantastic, <laughs> I would like to say. Um, we'll stay on, give it an extra minute or so. Um, otherwise, you know, we, we will share our contact details and of course we will share the slides and the recording for this session. So if you have more specific case by case sort of questions, then of course you're welcome to reach out to us. But I'll give it another uh, minute or so just to allow anyone to address, uh, to uh, provide us with any questions. So I see there's one question. It says, do you have to live in Sweden to get a work permit? Anyone, any takers from my team on this one? Uh, no? Yeah, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just reading the question in the chat. Um, do you have to live in Sweden to get a work permit? No, you don't. But you need to have an offer from a Swedish employer. Uh, to be able to come here and then initiate your application. Actually, the main rule is that you apply from outside of Sweden. So no, only in exceptional cases you can apply from within Sweden. I hope and that answers well, your question. Yeah, and just to, to highlight the, the new permit category is also the intention of that one is to come in without having an employment offer. So you come in with the purpose of looking for work or setting up a business. So uh, not necessarily on both counts uh, in this case. And I can also see there's another question there, Josie, right? Well, yeah, what's uh, I have a question here. What six? What is the expected case handling time? Uh, the time for job seeking visas? I can I can take that question. Uh, the job seeking permit or for the highly qualified workers 
It's still very unclear. We do not have any information on how long the processing time will be, but hopefully we'll get to know that once the new legislation has come into force in two weeks time. So more information will follow on this. Great, thanks Dylan. And I guess that's that kind of really sums up a lot of the topics that we discussed today. You know, we've tried to provide our assessment and based on what we know as of today and what we've seen from the migration agency or from the proposals. But a lot of this is still really to be clarified. And as you mentioned, Alan, you know, just to, if we take the PR case from last year, a lot of these legal sort of discussions and, and uh, clarifications on the migration agency didn't come until much, much more time after. You could say probably six or more months after and we're still feeling those effects today. Do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, I think there was a question about the 44 months uh, rule. I have a question about the 44 months requirement to get the permanent residence. Does that mean that, for example, we cannot have more than 30 days of holidays out of Sweden per year? Yes. So it's four months. Yes, that's the short answer. So as you kind of point out with your question here is that, yeah, that is not a very long time if you, especially if you travel for work. Uh, so that's why this new legislation is really welcomed and then give you an opportunity to apply for an extension so you later on can apply for permanent residence if that's what you want. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. There's another question here. Changes such as salary increases, must these also be registered to migration agency? Uh, well, uh, if the salary is increased, this does not need to be reported to the migration agency. It's only if the employment conditions have, I would say, worsened in quotation marks. And uh, this can be interpreted in different ways. For example, if the basic salary has uh, decreased, but the benefits has increased, this is also something that will need to be reported to the migration agency. So any changes to the employment contract that are not as what was stated in the first offer of employment. And we're still yet to find out exactly how to report these exact changes, as you said, Dylan. I've got another question here as well, where it says, is there any upper limit on how long you can stay out of Sweden and still get your residence uh, extended? Well, I guess the proposal really is to kind of to eliminate these kind of absences from Sweden as you can sort of extend unlimitedly going forward. Uh, so there won't be necessarily a limit in terms of how much you can stay abroad, but you still need to bear in mind the permanent residence criteria, as Anand has explained uh, during this presentation. And here's another question. Do you see a need for the company to match the title in the employment contract and offer of employment now? Um, well, yes, they should match. That's our conclusion and that's what we've advised. So far, we don't know how the migration agency will view these changes, obviously. And if you would submit a contract that says one thing and the offer of employment says something else, but they should be a mirror of each other, so to speak. So at the moment, we advise that yes, you should keep the same role if possible. I see that we have a follow up question to the job seeking permit or the highly skilled worker permit. Um, the question is just to be sure the application for the new job seeking needs to be applied for from outside Sweden. Yes, that is correct. So you need to have this permit in place before arriving to Sweden. Thanks. We also have a question regarding the contracts that need to be submitted. So the question is, what if the assignment contract only refers to an assignment policy for terms and conditions? Would you recommend to submit both documents? So our, recommend, our recommendation is that all agreements that stipulate the conditions that will cover the employee should be submitted. So um, just to be sure, yes, that would that would be need to be need to be submitted.
there's another question here about um, reporting to the Migration Agency. It was mentioned that employers need to communicate any changes in the contract to the Migration Agency. In case of employee will go on parental leave, the employer also need to inform the authorities. Now, this we've discussed in our group and we do think there's an argument to say that the employment conditions have not been worsened here because the individual still remains on the same salary, uh, you know, contractually, but they do get parental leave. And how it's been currently, you submit um, from, uh, you know, uh, not pay slips, but from the insurance for Schäckenskassen. What is the word in English? Sorry, I'm losing it. <laughs> Social security. Social security to show that you've been receiving parental leave benefit. Um, but we don't know yet. We will wait for the migration agency's guidelines. Um, but we for sure think there's an argument for that it should not be a case of worsening employment conditions. So I hope that answered your question. There's also another question here. Is the general recommendation still to remain in Sweden during the processing time of an extension? Or does this change with the new entry visa? What should we suggest to our employees? Well, the, the recommendation still remains if you have filed an extension application and your current permit has expired, you can you should still remain in Sweden. If you need to travel for business or work purposes, the new legislation should allow the, the uh, a D visa application to be applied for from within Sweden for that purpose, but only for the main work permit holder. So depending on the need of the, of the employee's travel, a D visa can be possible. However, if the applicant just wants to travel on a holiday or has a family emergency and needs to return home or something, those are not acceptable circumstances for a D visa. So in the end of the day, it's depending on the reason for why the employee needs to travel, uh, whether they can in the first place apply for a D visa. But in the first point, yes, they still need to remain in Sweden uh, whilst they have an ongoing application because they may face difficulties upon returning to Sweden if they do not have a valid permit. So I hope that answers that question. And then we also have a question regarding the titles. Um, for the um, employee, do you see a need for the company to match the title in the employment contract and in the offer of employment now? I would say yes, because there is a high risk that the migration agency uh, reacts to this if the titles don't match. Uh, otherwise, we would need to submit an explanation as why the titles differ uh, in the offer of employment and in the contract. I'm not sure if we responded to the first question from Hannah. What if the assignment contract only refers to an assignment policy for terms and conditions? Would you I think recommend? I responded to that. Yes. What we said there was if if the contract uh, stipulates conditions that will Great. cover the employee, then yes, that is recommended. Great. I missed that. There's a question also, employment contract with provisional period, say six months, will this impact the work permit period that the individual will be granted? Well, there is a risk that the individual will only be granted six months permit. But we also see this in one way as unlikely because then the migration agency will have to extend and extend and extend a, a numerous amount of permits. Uh, so hopefully this will not be the case. But again, we're not 100% sure. Could you repeat the part of the job seeking permit? Does the applicant need, uh, we responded to that Dylan, right? Does the applicant need to be outside uh, of Sweden to apply for the job seeking permit? Yes, we did respond to that. Yes. Uh, to be outside Sweden to apply for a job seeking, but later on can apply for a work permit inside Sweden, correct? So to elaborate that, um, the job seeking permit or the highly skilled uh, workers permit will need to apply, be applied for abroad. The individual will, uh, will arrive to Sweden on this permit, and if they are offered employment in Sweden during that permit period while they are in Sweden, they can start working as soon as they've submitted an application for a work permit. So it will be a change of status. And for instance, as we also mentioned, this job seeking permit will only be valid for nine months. 
So let's say we submit the application one week before the expiry of that permit and the application is still being processed, this individual is allowed to remain and work in Sweden. But as with other permits, it was, it's not advisable to leave Sweden during this uh, processing time. I hope that answers your question. Okay, we still have five minutes, so feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. And if we don't get the time to, or if we don't get around to addressing all the questions specifically, then we will of course uh, send out the responses to every question we've received today. Some of these that might be case specific, we will need to look into in more detail. And as we've said, there's still a lot more clarity needed from the Swedish Migration Agency before we can give detailed responses. So we will come back to all the questions, of course, later and send those together with the slides and the recording. And like Jose say, we will also share, share our contact details. So you feel welcome to just email us or call us and we can have a conversation about any questions that you might have. We will be happy to respond to them. OK, well, it's, it's died down in terms of the questions. So maybe people want four minutes back and they get a coffee. So I'm just going to say thank you to everyone um, for listening in. And thank you, of course, to my team for participating in this session. Uh, and as Ellen has said, you'll see our contact details there. Uh, feel free to reach out to us separately if you have anything specific or any additional questions you want to uh, address. As of when developments occur and more clarity is provided, we will of course release further alerts and information about this. Uh, but in the meantime, feel free to you know, reach out to us. Thanks again and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.